right, welcome. Hopefully you enjoyed that new Amid the Ruins, baby. I know you guys love that. Um, not sure I heard that album. That's a different album, Bay's Nerd. So I was delighted to see that, and uh, you can find his channel there as Amid the Ruins 1453. All right. Got to turn on the tweet here. Let these goobers over on Twitter up in my mess in my grill oh man did I forget to turn the microphone on again no all right microphone on Twitter Twitter goobers uh, how y'all doing tonight trying to drink some coffee trying to wake up Is no one coming to the space? Did I do this wrong? What is going on? Oh my goodness. It's because I'm late. Woo, I'm so late. Y'all gonna fire me? You are fired from YouTube live streaming. Susan called. Susan Wojcicki said, you're fired. You are one of the top IRL streamers on YouTube, but you're fired. So, no more drama streams. No more fights with... Why is this not working, dude? Couldn't start the space. Start now. Oh, now, come on. It's not going to work. Give me a minute, dude. Y'all can hear me, right? The stupid Twitter space. Well, I don't even think I'm going to have time to do Twitter spaces anyway, so maybe we just cross that out. I guess that'll do it. Get out of here. Twitter space will get you. All right, what are we up to tonight? Well, um, you know, everybody loves to dissect the debates. Everybody has a lot of fun with that. Tonight, we are not going to dissect. Well, it's kind of a debate. Um, it's really just the evisceration and mutilation, you could say, of Sam Harris intellectually by a guy who I don't even know who this guy is. I don't have any interest. Oh, my gosh. Just get that dude out of here. I have no interest in this. Um, interview excuse me in his philosophy i don't know what his philosophy is but uh you can't hear me oh i know what it is i got that thing turned down low anyway i mean i ain't said nothing anyway i've been yapping i've been yapping is it better now I had the little thingamajig kind of turned down, get turned up. So when you use the multi-output device, everything gets off. I can't explain it to you people. You wouldn't understand it anyway. It's way over your heads. And Apple has a tendency to reset their settings. So is that better? It's just never going to work, right? You just accept it, guys. There's never going to be a situation where you just turn it on. And the levels are, even when the levels are the exact same. Part of that is because you have to change every YouTube video's volume level. So, hopefully this will play right because I don't know what level Sam and his interlocutor are at. But, so, the is ought question, as you guys know, came up last week when we covered... Old Jordan Peterson, when he was doing that, sound is gone. Sound shouldn't be gone. Is the sound gone? See, I can't tell because of the chats behind. Is the, is the sound good? I don't want to sit here talking until... I just, I'm only going to pay attention to the mods comments because I trust them. And uh, we are getting into the is ought question. And then uh, I turned up this, got turned up on this interview, debate, whatever this is, quasi debate from four years ago. So Sam Harris has not 
evolved beyond this question in four years, he's still saying the exact same gibberish in response to this very self obvious, self evident point. Now I'm saying self evident in a colloquial sense, not in a deep epistemic sense, just kind of in a on the face value. Like, I mean, <laughs> there's, there shouldn't be much debate about the fact that you can't derive an ought from an is, right? How would you get normativity out of the fact that things are a certain way on the atheist materialist paradigm? And of course, this is the argument that goes back to uh, David Hume and kind of gets into his distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact. And when you start getting into the moral domain and saying that this event or this action should have happened or should not have happened, or we ought to do this, we ought not to do that, that is an illicit derivation from the object objective state of affairs. So just because something is a certain way, you are unjustified in saying, oh, but it ought to be this way. Now, maybe it ought to be that way. But the point is that you're going to have to give an account for deriving logically speaking the ought from an is so david hume is not interested in in completely obliterating the ideas of moral obligations he just doesn't think that you can epistemically justify them and most of, of secular atheist academia has not advanced beyond this point now some people think they can solve this question sam harris is one of the atheist intellectuals who thinks that this problem is solvable. Uh, and so four years later, the recent podcast with Dr. Jordan Peterson, this very issue came back. And we saw for about an hour, Sam Harris rambling, fumbling, basically not giving any kind of coherent answer at all, but still somehow thinking, still somehow imagining that this counts as a reply and what did he say? If I could get to a point of raw, uninterpreted sense data with no connecting beliefs or ideas, just raw, immediate sense data. Although, again, we know from Sellers and the myth of the given, this is a complete fantasy. Uh, you're not ever going to get the givenness of objects without assuming that there's objects in the external world to causally present that givenness to you, which is the very thing that's in question that's unjustified. You're never going to get that on that paradigm. It's just something you'd have to assume. But can you justify that assumption? That's the issue here. Now, remember, we uh, also titled this, this stream tonight, transcendent argument so it's also partly going to be about that and we're going to see how a presuppositional critique transcendent argumentation is basically applicable here even though this isn't directly about transcendental arguments now in an indirect way it is because sam harris is in the position of a very typical atheist type of guy i mean he kind of is in many ways you could say just like the face the icon of the you know standard reddit tier atheist person that most of you will encounter in apologetics we you know we want to be concerned with well what's the position i'm most likely to encounter in the world that challenges me right is it going to be uh keepers of the flame for the heaven's gate cult right am i going to be out there doing apologetic debates over the scholastic systematic theology of Marshall Applewhite with his with his apple white eyes glaring at you? No, probably not. One in a zillion. Am I going to be out there in the field running around on campus striking up debates with uh, Osho's right-hand men? With Osho's with the booger with Osho's the papers are retarded. No, I'm not going to be doing apologetic debates with strange Osho theology. I am going to be doing, you will be doing debates with 
acolytes of Sam Harris because they are a dime a dozen and everyone thinks, of course, this is the enlightened position. 99% of the normie world, the Reddit, sophisticated internet, Kumpod dweller believes that this is philosophy and this is sophistication. So that's why we want to use him in this kind of a discussion as a great example, a launch pad for you to understand this approach, this form of argumentation, this form of reasoning. A lot of the atheists are under the impression that this is all made up word salad. No, I assure you that X is the necessary condition of Y. Y, therefore, X is a valid form of argumentation. It's not That's not word salad, and that's the a form of a transcendental argument. Jamie. I had to scream for another coffee in there just because I'm so lit tonight. I'm turned up. Yes, please. I'm turned up because I was turned down mysteriously. And so a little Sammy H here. Your boy, little Sammy H, is going to be a perfect example of how we would go about doing a kind of internal critique, presuppositional critique of the opposing positions paradigm on the question of moral realism and deriving oughts, normativity from is, from the fact that something is the case. The tree is green, but should I paint that tree psychedelic colors? Because it ought not to be green. It ought to be a psychedelic rainbow tree. So that I can go out as Terrence McKenna and enjoy nature as it should be a glowing rainbow in all of its beautimous facets. Should it be a Terrence McKenna tree? See, that's different from, is it presently a Terrence McKenna tree. No, it is just simply a boring old tree, some brown and some green. You see the difference between is and ought, right? Now, Harris seems to understand basically what this problem is, right? We saw in the Jordan Peterson podcast, he claimed to, I'm not saying it's not true, but I'm just saying he claims to, to know philosophy. Uh, and he mentioned, I don't remember what, he mentioned a few philosophers kind of in passing, um, mentions Hume and I don't remember Wittgenstein or somebody else. Maybe I don't remember who he mentioned, but so, I mean, he does kind of have a familiarity and some kind of undergrad degree in philosophy. I don't remember, but he doesn't, he seems to kind of get the problems, but then think rather than learning more about the critiques, I'm going to hear the problem and then flee to my corner to construct out of my own head, some attempted rescue position justification which is just nowhere near getting off the ground and that's what we're going to see and notice too uh that there will be a lot of filibustering a lot of talking in circles a lot of moral outrage faux moral outrage and emotional appeals and uh let's give you a big example of a very terrible version of a, an emotional appeal um if I were to say something like, you know, in, in, in my life, in my experience, I have I have just seen so many people that profess theism who were rapists and murderers and uh, abusers of women and just the worst people. And so, I mean, do you want to class yourself as my opponent with rapers and murderers and abusers of women? Because if you disagree with me, you're with them. Okay, and being with them is to be like them, birds of a feather. And I think we all want to be on the side of justice and truth. That is an emotional appeal. Don't you want to be on the side of the good people? <laughs> and it really, uh, you can see what, so it, the fact that you disagree with me, doesn't mean that you are in a group with all the other people who disagree with me 
and that you all have therefore the same views because you disagree with me. That's just silly, right? But you notice this all the time, right? Council culture, it functions on this basis. Clearly, right? Media narratives, the way the uh, left media, for example, paints people who disagree as right, the most extreme and they're all one group. Those are simple tactics, you could say, from a psychological warfare or a political pers perspective. But guess what? They're also fallacies. So I would say after ad hominem, you know, red herring straw men, those are the probably the most typical fallacies that you'll see promoted in media and advertising and, you know, all that stuff. Probably next up would be something like an emotional appeal. And we saw that constantly with Harris when he was doing those debates. I think we've covered three, two or three Harris debates, two. And in both of those, uh, both Peterson and William Lane Craig, the argumentation was literally nothing but emotional appeals. And this is not new either. Uh, I remember one of the first things I read when I was getting into presuppositional apologetics. Um, I hope you guys, if you can find it, it's a great, it's a classic introduction to this topic. Somewhere it's out there. Uh, yeah, thank you, by the way, Jim Bob. I forgot. Yeah, genetic fallacies uh, are also in the, definitely in the top five for sure. That's a classic. Now, there's a really good essay. I want to say it's written by Bonson. It's either Bonson or Van Til, but it's, and it might, maybe, maybe an audio lecture of Bonson's. Now I can't remember, but no, it's a lecture. I mean, an essay. It's a critique of Bertrand Russell's arguments in Why I'm Not a Christian. Now, Why I'm Not a Christian is actually a book by Bertrand Russell, but within that book is probably the famous kind of summary essay, Why I'm Not a Christian, in the book, Why I'm Not a Christian. And it's a, a classic kind of, you know, because Bertrand Russell was kind of like the new atheist of 100 years ago, right? So back in that time, he was the, the pop atheist guy, like Dawkins and Harris and Dennett and Hitchens. So if you can find, let's see if can we, let's see if we can find that. I don't even know if that is, uh, let's see if we can find that. Bonson, why I am not Christian. It's a great uh, example, Pete, like a sample of Bonson going through and just doing Uh, I think this is it. Bonson on Birch and Russell. It sounds like it might be it. I think this is it. Maybe. Uh, anyway, let me... Uh, if this isn't it, this looks like kind of a brief summary. So I'll put this in the chat for you guys here. And... Uh, that does look like it though but it's been a while since i've read this thank you so what he does is essentially the type of thing that you hear me do quite frequently which is just go through bertrand russell's essay and kind of pick apart each of these arguments and point out that um you know this is just a lot of emotional appeals and fallacies you know russell didn't really give any argumentation hardly if that's the right essay Surely that's it. That's got to be it. But I probably haven't read that in 20 years, so I'm not positive. That. But it's a great introduction to the topic. Uh, if you can find, maybe it's Van Til's. I don't know. But anyway, you guys get the point. Um, so, you know, this is probably our eighth or ninth talk on transcendental argumentation over the years. So I'm not going to go over everything that we've already covered in the previous eight or nine talks. I'm going to assume that you guys have watched those and you kind of know the basic idea here. And let's get into this because not that long. This is actually a key 20 minute clip within this longer discussion. And it's, it's going to be really relevant. Now this Carol guy, even though I think he's got some weird views or something, he's a physicist, right? So, but he knows philosophy. Uh, again, I'm not, He's not a presuppositionalist, right? He's not relevant to that necessarily. 
But we're going to point out that this argument moves in that direction. It's a great example of what we want to do on our side. So let's listen to the problem. And the best part about this is just how clear, quick, and precise this Dr. Carroll is with like just demolishing and destroying and pointing out the flaws in Harris's argumentation. Up to the area that I think more concerns me, and it's the area we've disagreed about in the past, which is the, the status of things like values and claims of right and wrong and good and evil, the ethics in, in the natural order. You have made much of this notion that you've derived from, from Hume that you can't get an ought from an is. But perhaps you want to you prop that up. Like I, in the past, in my book, The Moral Landscape, and in, I think it was the, the TED talk I gave that you reacted to way back when, it was 2010. I claim to- Oh my God, it's 2010, really? 2010, <laughs> yeah. That's how quickly time flies. Right. So I claim that we, you can make ultimately rigorous scientific claim. You guys can hear them are right, right? Like is, is little Sammy H coming through good? About right and wrong and good and evil. And I was arguing for a kind of what I would call a moral realism, which is to say that there are facts about the well-being of conscious creatures, which is which can serve everything we could conceivably mean by right and wrong and good and evil. And these are naturalistic facts, and you can be right and wrong about them. And realism in, in this sense is the fact that there is a reality, whether you understand it or not, your claims about it can be more or less right or wrong. It's possible not to know what you're missing. And I extend that to the domain. We want to take a, uh, yeah, this mic is acting weird here. Let me make sure that's buttons right. Now, remember that we could go into different um, arenas with how we would want to critique what he said already. We're going to be focusing on deriving oughts from is and the notion of getting um, normativity, right? And how that doesn't work for what he's he's trying to do. But there's other arenas that we could go down, right? We, we could critique other things. We could go in the direction of saying that um, he is claiming that there's facts in the external world. Okay, what does it mean to say that there's facts in an external world, right? So I don't think he's even aware of the, the many, many things that would be presupposed in just that kind of a sentence. We could go into talking about causal relations that are assumed. That there's a knower who can know a meaningful fact. That there's an external world. That those facts have identity over time as existing objects distinct from other objects. That there is a space-time realm by which you derive facts. That the proposition there are facts has meaning. That language and symbol has meaning. That meaning exists over time. That meaning can, can be conveyed from one mind to another mind. All of those things, which have not been demonstrated, are assumed in a single sentence and more now this guy doesn't know that and that's the point that we keep hammering home is that he's oblivious to all of the things that's being assumed induction deduction logic words meaning concepts right all these things that you hear me constantly talking about all of those things not one of those things all of those things go together for the world to exist in a way it's like a fine-tuning version of tag is what I'm doing here or the fine-tuning argument it's not just matter and space and oxygen that's fine-tuned I'm making a tag fine-tuned argument that the elements of preconditions are also all fine-tuned and they all go together you wouldn't have concepts without a conceptual realm you wouldn't have knowledge without a knower it's a knower on an atheist materialist account. Purpose, causation, all of these things. Values. Here, of course, Harris is trying to rescue a devastating critique 
We, we can set aside all of these metaphysical points and epistemic points that I've listed. And what we're going to do tonight is pick a simple one, getting an ought from an is. Values, ethics, everybody loves that. That's an easy thing to go to. Everybody's a social justice warrior on the internet. Virtue signaling, pointing out how good they are. What is good? How do you justify your ethical claims? Especially if you're an atheist materialist, agnostic, etc. It's no good. What are you talking about? It's just That's just subjective preferences. Okay, you can't get any kind of ought- from subjective, who are you to tell me what to do, man? And mind your own business, dude. <laughs> truth is just truth for you, man. It's whatever's whatever, bro. Right? This kind of a thing. And yet then suddenly we're told how we've got to be moral and ethical and you've got to obey this, you know, social whatever. But on what basis are any of these things evil or good? For you to tell me something is evil, you've got to tell me and give an account for the good. So let's listen. And, and everybody's always saying, how can you make tag simpler? You get too philosophical. We're going to pick something that hopefully is a simpler approach and, and thing to pinpoint. Okay, You're looking for easy things to pinpoint in an atheist materialist paradigm. This is a great one. And this is one that hits at the level of every man. It's not going to matter whether they've got philosophical prowess, whether they've read a bunch of books or not, because this is something everybody has some view of right and wrong, right? Metaphysics, epistemology, those are pretty abstract. They are a little difficult for a lot of people. A lot of slow boys. Apparently, America is 50% slow boy because half of America can't read a book written at eighth grade level. I'm not joking. That's a real statistic. Uh, according to Kotel. Now, if that's the case, then we're going to have to dumb this down. <laughs> dumb this down. Let's bring it down to that fourth grade level. Fourth grade tag right now. Out on the playground. <laughs> Recess. Tag time. We're not talking about tag. Tag your it. We're talking about tag. Precept. Out there on the playground. The playground. ABC. Boys to men. ABC. BBD. Um... How are we going to focus in, pinpoint on something to critique? That's what you're going to have to do, right? So if you're discussing with your atheist friend, your atheist buddy, and he's giving his position, his moral, the Christians are all evil for doing blah, blah, blah. Oh, really? Evil for doing blah, blah, blah. Now, you as an atheist materialist believe that everything just is, just matter of motion, it just is. But now you're going to tell me about morally binding rights and wrongs. There is no right and wrong if everything just is. That was David Hume's point centuries ago as an atheist skeptic. Keep that in mind. We're not following David. A lot of the slow boys think he follows David Hume because he quotes him. Yes, everyone I quote, I follow religiously. Yeah, sure. That makes a lot of sense, right? Come on. So keep that in mind. That's what we're looking for. We're going to listen to, even though Sean Carroll isn't a presuppositionalist again, he's going to it just in tiger blood, Charlie Sheen mode, devastate and, and just dice up like a freaking Jensu, this nonsense gibberish pseudo argumentation from ham, from ham Saris. I'm, I'm, even when I accidentally, when I'm saying names now, I just like say the name in the re, the reverse. Ham Saris. Pain of questions of value, right? And you are, are a fan of Hume's parsing of this matter. So perhaps give give me the reasons why not from the Hume side, and then we can. Sure, I think that there's two slightly different claims. Um, one would be the claim that you can derive ought from is, which I think is just manifestly wrong uh very that's, that's just logically wrong all from is manifestly wrong everybody has a weird have you noticed people's cadence i was listening to people podcasts you know today and i was thinking about how weird people's cadences are and this guy like he goes at the la the end of his sentence has a hi <laughs> right and by the rules of logic garbage in garbage out Values in, values out, facts in, facts out. By using the rules of deductive logic, you cannot 
derive conclusions about properties that did not somehow appear in the axioms or the premises from which you did your logic. Uh, so I think that's just a non-starter. Now, just to unpack that a little more, so yeah. the claim, Hume's claim was that there's no description of the way the world is. There's no f factual description of the universe which can tell you how it ought to be or how you should act within it, right? So it's, it's the, the oughts and shoulds get smuggled in. You have to add something that you want. You have to have, add a goal, say, and then on your account, science can tell you how to reach that goal. But the goal is something that you, the value-laden goal is something that you are smuggling in. That's right. So Hume, you know, I feel bad because uh, late in life, I realized that Hume should have been my hero all along. One of the very few shortcomings of my philosophical undergraduate education was that I was at a Catholic university and Hume was the bad guy. Well, this is ironic because at a, being at a Catholic university and then appreciating David Hume, presumably that's because he moved in the wrong direction, <laughs> right? Uh, and he should have figured out and enjoyed David Hume from our position, right? We have the correct view of David Hume because we, we can understand him as the consistent atheist, the consistent skeptic who's interested in pointing out that justification is just not going to work anymore if we're going to be empiricists. And 99.9% .9 of the atheist materialists are rank naive empiricists. That's the position. And it leads to an incapacitation an emasculation and a deracination for justification. I just did that on the fly. Come on now. Come on now. I did it on the fly. So I didn't realize until much later that he was the good guy. Um, and however, bless his heart, he was not the clearest writer all the time. And he was the clearest thinker, but he was also mischievous. So he would make his points via dialogue or sarcasm or jokes <laughs> and the is and ought uh, analysis is exactly that he's he's it, it's not his you know most definitive careful logical piece of writing because basically he's making fun of people who he thinks are making this mistake he says i'm i'm reading people writing about what is true and is true in that yeah that's what he was aiming at and then suddenly it's about what ought to be true and it didn't come from anywhere and so he kind of implies that you can't do it and so i think that's right i think that uh the the conclusion i would in that case i would believe the strong conclusion namely that in order to derive conclusions about what ought to be true or what should be true or what is morally right, we have to include in our theory an assumption or an axiom that relates to values, that relates to what is good and what, what ought to do. I think that is a straightforward computational science claim, that you can't do the logic from there. Now, even if you believe that claim, which everyone should believe, um, you could still argue about moral realism versus anti-realism. It's totally possible to be a moral realist and a moral objectivist and still admit that you can't derive a lot from it. Well, it's possible, but <laughs> not justifiable, right? You're not going to get there in any coherent way um, unless you just, okay, well, let's just be arbitrary. Okay, and if we can just be arbitrary, then uh, we're just, then there's no such thing as debate. So once arbitrariness is allowed, then there's no such thing as debate because uh, I can be just as arbitrary as you, you see. Yeah, so I've always viewed that little bit of Hume, and again, it is kind of an aside. It's not something he argues for at length, and yet people have made much of it in philosophy and in science. You notice him downplaying that because it's a huge problem for his position. So he's like, well, Hume didn't spend a lot of time on that argument and people have made a big deal about it. Well, that, so, I mean, if it's a simple argument, do I need to spend a lot of time making, you know, 500 page books about it? Or can I just make the argument? And then that has nothing to do with this devastation. But of course, the master of deflection here uh, comes in to downplay this central problem for his position. I viewed it as a kind of semantic trick, which need not confine our thinking about these things it's a little bit like again so it should be obvious right away so how does he begin to try to deal with this to deflect it into semantics hume's objection which is a epistemic slash logical objection okay nothing to do with the definitions of words although i'm sure he's going to tell us how it is about the definitions of words you're not going to redefine words to get around objections 
A lot of atheists do this. I think they think it's like a clever way to talk around a problem when they're pinned down or when their position is shown to be foolish. How many times have you heard an atheist say, you're playing word games? You're just playing word games. Ha ha. Ha ha. You're playing word games. I gotcha. When, in fact, you made a very clear, very concise, pinpoint accuracy argument with a scalpel. Right. You cut out their tumorous argument with a scalpel. And how do they respond? Oh, you're playing a word game. And when, obviously, you're not. Come on. It's not a word game. And that's the direction that Sam's doing here. Zeno's paradox. Zeno says, you know, in order for an arrow to hit its target, it must move halfway to the target and then halfway again and halfway again. And then. Now, this is odd because he's likening the objection to his position, which is a clear refutation, to something totally different, which is a paradox. <laughs> a paradox is not a contradiction. And deflecting this over into con uh, something like that. Again, is a deflection. So I have them turned all the way up. I don't know what else to tell you. I've got, there's just no way to make this work perfectly. I think I could turn them up a little bit more. Maybe I need to scale it back a little bit. I don't know why, but a lot of these YouTube videos, when you play them in this format, they just play really low, even though I've got it cranked all the way up. Ergo, it never arrives. But of course, arrows don't have to fly that way. Arrows can just fly all the way to the target. And if you want to add, if you need mathematics where you sum the infinite series or you do find some way of nullifying that argument, fine. But it's set up as a, and it took hundreds of years for people to figure out why it's wrong. But it is just, it's an unnatural constraint imposed by, in that case, just the, the geometry of the situation. In Hume's case, it's just the meaning we're giving words like. Yeah, so just give words new meanings and then it doesn't, it's not a problem. Now, remember that for most atheists, actually, you could probably argue 99.9% .9 of them, unless they have some weird kind of fringe view, they will say that our conceptual schemes the things that are the systems the concepts the words the meanings that we have for understanding the external world are human created constructs now if all of our systems logic math words sentences grammar if that's all purely a human creation there's no extra mental thing in which our principles, logic, abstractions are grounded, i.e. the divine mind, then it seems to follow, as 99.9% .9 of the atheists would agree, that the conceptual schema is a complete human construct. Now, that's not what Harris was intentionally saying, but that's probably what his position would affirm or lead to. Because unless he wants to affirm the real existence of abstract entities or objects or universals, which 99.9% .9 of atheists don't, they don't want to go in that direction, then he's going to default to, well, yeah, we just make up these systems. They're just human schemas. Numbers are just, right, just made up by men. But at the same time as the internal mental system is a human construct, the principles of the external world that are supposed to match up to those concepts are supposed to be totally one-to-one -one, totally objective totally rational totally consistent with one another connected to one another and regular you see do you see what i'm getting at if i believe that my conceptual framework my mental schema for how i understand the world is a human construct. I can't then turn around and say and act as if the words and the, the, the schema and all of that also literally matches up to things in the external world. Cause I can't make that move. It's not a val. It's, I don't have the right to make that move. You see, it's just a huge assumption. And when I start to 
act as if that is the case. Now I'm starting to point out that, well, then it can't just be a human construct, right? Truth, value, etc. Meaning these things can't be purely human constructs because where are they grounded? How are they grounded? How do we know that they match up to objects in the external world? Now, if you've read the Mannion paper, you know that at a certain point he brings this up. He says that, you know, for foundationalists and the kind of classic foundationalist position, it hadn't really occurred to those people yet that, well, wait a minute. Is our conceptual scheme found in sense data? If our conceptual scheme is not found in sense data, then now we've got illicit moves that we're making, you see. Because what's the basis for the conceptual scheme by which we are understanding the principles of the world, right? Predicating about objects, etc. So I'm just pointing out that if you understand that objection, then not only can Harris not get up the ground, like he's not even going to be able to make sentences. Do you see how devastating this critique is? Ought and should versus is. Now, I think so let's... The other way to, to come at it, from my point of view, is you can give up all notion of ought and should. Let's say you, we're, we're in the universe and there is no ought or should, or let, let's discover the oughts and shoulds. I mean, one, one question I have, which doesn't originate with me, I think many people oppose it this way, but if, if all the facts, if all the is claims in the universe aren't enough to give you some guidance as to how you ought to live, just what could give you that guidance, right? I mean, we're talking... So... Sam Harris doesn't understand the, the, the issue of justification, right? So as often happens in this type of a discussion, people don't know what is expected or what kind of thing would count as a justification. And we see this all the time. And really, Harris here is just reflecting probably what most atheists will say in response to the is I question, right? And he's saying something like, well, you know, if you really want to make this a problem, then why don't we just say that this is the best we can do? right we just if you want to flourish and do well then you got to have moral values that help you flourish and do well that's essentially where he'll go in this and, he, and he's just going to say you know it's just the best we've got so why do you keep bringing up this point that's not a justification right this is a really simple point philosophically speaking right I mean, if you have a certain position and you're going to enforce that kind of a justification on everyone else, then you're going to have to do the same thing. And these kinds of people do that all the time, right? It's like, where's your justification for your miracle claims? Where's your justification for faith in that book? Where's your justification for belief in the existence of Jesus, a man 2,000 years ago, right? You've got to do all this work. You've got to justify every little nook and cranny of any claim you make. And then when it comes to like, the big glaring elephant in the room assumptions and presuppositions that they have. Oh, come on. Oh, why, why, are you, why are you harassing me? Why are you giving me a lot of time on this? Why are you giving me a lot of time on this? Why are you busting your ball? Why are you busting my balls on this? Right? Suddenly they go, Tony Soprano. Why are you busting my balls on this? Hey. Right? Because it's obvious that they don't have a justification. But as to whether Sam Harris himself actually grasps the notion of what justification is, that I'm not sure about. All right? I mean, we've seen him kind of have huge gaps in his philosophical understanding. He seems at times then to surprise us with actually knowing what the issue is. And so you think, oh, does he actually understand the issue? And then when asked for justification, it's like he doesn't even know what justification is, right? But then again, how many times have we seen people, public academics supposedly, with no concept or idea what justification is? Or even anything close to it. On my life, T. It was the worst justification I ever heard. Now, again, so... Why do we want to stress that? Because most of the time, <coughs> atheists will think, or the materialists will say, 
They'll give you a story. They'll report a story. Well, we evolved to do this, and then we evolved to do this, and this. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Telling me a story, an account of events, is not a justification. I didn't ask you for a series of causal chains that led to why this is happening. I asked you for the justification for deriving oughts from is. It's a very simple question. It might sound a little obtuse. It's not. In Basically, we're just saying, why should I make the move from the fact that something is the case to that it ought or ought not be this or that way? Do you see the difference? And so Sam Harris wants me to believe that you can, as a naturalist, atheist, materialist, make the move to moral realism. By the way, let's not even bring up the fact that he is a determinist. How are you going to have moral realism and oughts with determinism, which is a whole other level of stupidity and impossibility on top of this? But we're just going to move. We're going to stay on this question of the is and the ought. And let's listen to him get eviscerated. That's in my book. Yes, yes. So I think Dan Dennett has made this point and, and others have. So that's worth wondering, right? Like what, what extra piece would you be hoping for? But let's say that What we're hoping for is a logical justification. It's not an extra piece. It's not some outlandish, crazy thing that's being requested. It's the very same justification that you request of every theist. The very same principles justification that you're required to give for your principles and your beliefs is the same justification that we're asking of the theist. Remember in the Matt Dillahunty debate, how many times did I hammer this point home? Matt, you said no one should believe in anything unless they have empirical sense data to prove it. You just told me in the midst of this debate, Matt, that transcendental categories are not physical empirical things but they must be the case. What is the justification for believing that, given what you just said? I'm not asking you if you believe it. I'm not asking you if you like it. I'm not asking you for a causal chain story of history, of why people evolved to do this. I'm asking for a justification. It's a very simple point that you would learn in one epistemology class, had you had one. Trent. Trent Horn, hello. T-Dump, had you had one? Matt Delahunty, had you had one class in epistemology? The issue of justification would come up. Go watch any philosophy professor's lectures. Now, there's going to be debates about justification. But what it is, it's not in debate. I mean, I've got the freaking textbooks sitting beside me. The things you hear me read out, I'm just regurgitating what's in the textbooks from my epistemology classes, okay? No, no such thing, thing as ought or should. Well, let's start there. It seems pretty clear to me that the ground truth of our circumstance as conscious beings is first consciousness. The, the, the something seems to be happening. What? So consciousness, which is something seems to be happening. How many times have we eviscerated this stupid Kogito? So he tries to go to some lame version of the Kogito, just like Trent Horn, which, again, how do these people think this is a good argument? And why is it that every atheist, materialist, and even this, the goofer, goofus Muslims that we've debated, they have the exact same position and starting point? Empirical sense data, foundationalism. Molyneux, Trent Horn, T. Dump, Sam Harris, Azra Rashid, Matt Delhunty. Everyone making the same arguments and the same starting point. Not a one of them understanding what justification is. There's an experiential character to this place. And this experience admits of a range of possibilities that we are, you know, we've all dimly discovered parts of this range we, we have nothing to do with justification speculating about the range of possible experiences that humans have and what science will figure it out one day that's nothing to do with justification he just doesn't understand what this question is and what it's asking for at excruciating experiences and sublimely happy experiences and we are trying to navigate 
nothing to do with justification, nothing close to the notion of justification. I mean, it's like, yeah, I think he thinks just talking, right? This is what we saw, I think, in the debates. He did this, right? Sam Harris's version of an argument is you just kind of talk for a while. Toward the latter and away from the former and helplessly trying. It's like, this is the values come in, put your hand on a hot stove, you will discover your value to get your hand off of it. Okay, so if values are merely instinctual reactions, that's not a value because my instinctual reaction has no value. It just is. So he's done, I think Molyneux did this. Remember when we were debating, Molyneux was like, you're talking about, you're talking about taste. You're talking about touch. You're talking about taste. Touch and taste. What? No, I'm talking about the notion of justifying the belief that there's meaningful sense data, that there's data in your sense, that there's some corresponding, you know, reaction between you and the external world that's meaningful and real. I mean, on and on. That's what I'm asking for. The justification for those assumptions for the knowledge claims. I'm not debating you on knowledge claims. I don't care about that because I'm not an evidentialist. I'm not going to grant you your worldview and your paradigm and argue with you over stupid evidences and the interpretation of evidences. I'm going to debate you on critiquing your presuppositions, your paradigm at a fundamental level. And when that's demolished, you can't argue. Very early. You don't have to be reasoned into it. This is as incontrovertible as anything you can experience. So he's just confusing um, desire emotive responses or intuitive instinctual response responses with values so so the fact that a species wants to survive or acts to survive has nothing at all to do with whether it should or ought to survive as a universal principle you see how simple the argument and the question is and carol will quickly and decisively call him on this there's certain things that you will just want to avoid and so to take a more abstract picture, there is content. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I meant to to, requ to say, uh, Jim Bob, vegans are a great example of this, right? The vegans are over here on, on the one hand, their, their dissociative state is telling you that there's nothing but pure survival of the fittest, atheist matter in motion. And then the other alter schizo personality on the other side of their head is saying, there's uh, absolute moral ethical requirements that you not use any animal products when even though all of nature is full of the principle of animals eating and using animal products, suddenly that's a value judgment that we ought not do. So they're the classic modern example in the fringe of these of atheism, right? Because most of them are atheists of deriving oughts from is great 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 example no better example perhaps than the atheist vegan cult there's the totality of actual and possible conscious minds that are open to this range of conscious experience okay here, here's this just rambling saying nothing the only thing i think i need to be a moral realist and for science ultimately to be the framework in which we talk about right and wrong and good and evil is to concede that the worst possible misery for everyone is bad. Yeah. So the only thing I need for moral realism is that we should avoid the worst possible bad. <laughs> and doesn't everybody agree that we should avoid the word worst possible bad? Therefore, I can derive an all from it is amazing level of just pitiful non-argumentation from a public intellectual. It's kind of amazing, really, that this passes for uh, being intellectual when I think most of us in this audience, right, you guys, can easily see why this does not count as justification. First of all, the fact that you think that this is all that's needed is totally irrelevant to the question of justification. That, again, doesn't matter. And to say that because most people want to, to uh, avoid something is not a justification and not a value because it's begging the question you are trying to derive an ought from an is and begging the question by the way on your worldview everyone is determined by chemical processes to desire that 
And also the people who desire the opposite are also determined by chemical processes to desire the opposite, to inflict pain, right? To endure pain. There are people who like this. They get off on it, right? Sexual weirdos, right? But on Sam Harris's view, there's no reason that one is better than the other because they're both encapsulated under pure determined chemical process. So if the good, and he's saying there is a good and a bad in his view, but if the good is just as chemically determined as the bad, it doesn't matter how many of the species, if 99% of the species prefers what he calls a good versus the 1% that prefers the bad, because the chemical reactions are just causing this. There's no actual ought or actual preference that's objective here that you ought to do this. It's just what is. So in other words, there's no reason to prefer the bad from the good in this worldview. And if there's no reason to prefer one or the other, then he's not a moral realist. It's an arbitrary position for him to be a moral realist. It is ad hoc. It is unjustified, you see. Right. If, any, if we should avoid anything, if we should do anything, we should get away from the worst possible misery for everyone. There you go. So here he brings in the oughts. We, making universal claims, all of us, presumably he means humans, ought to avoid the worst possible scenario. Not only is this begging the question, I mean, first of all, what is the worst? Who decides what's the criteria of avoiding the worst? Again, it begs the question. And then it begs the question again by saying that you ought to avoid the worst. What is the worst? What the species decides arbitrarily is the worst. Who? 50%? So there's like appeal to the masses fallacy to justify it. Uh, there's already the assumption of the worst. But this is a question about values. I'm asking for a justification for values at all. And he's saying, well, we look to the values. <laughs> Literally. You see, you see how silly this is. Every other state of the universe is better than that. If words like better, worst. So he's bringing in the value judgments, better and worst. When the question is about what is the scale for there to be better and worse, good and bad, which we've not get gotten anything like that so far. Good and bad and better and worse are going to mean anything ever. Having every possible conscious mind suffer as much as it possibly can for as long as it can to no good end, there's no silver lining, there's no lessons learned, this is just hell, right? That's bad and worth avoiding. And the answers as to how the minds involved would avoid this state. All right, so I'm going to skip past his sort of filibustering and blathering on because it's just more of the same and nothing go going anywhere, right? So let's get over here to Carol's uh, critique. Paradigm. Moral. And the metaethical question of whether we've just been hung up on the meanings of words. And the By the way, notice he's going to use the word metaethical. How many times have you heard me use this word? How many atheists have said this is not a thing? I made it up. What? Make this up? What are you talking about? <laughs> it's all these idiots out here. Oh, well, that's words out. Metaethics? That's words out. Or if you actually disagree. Well, there's, there's a, a little bit of gliding back and forth between what we call ethical questions and meta-ethical questions, right? Ethical questions on how we actually, you know, what is right and wrong, what should we do, what is moral, and the meta-ethical questions on how do we set up a system for deciding what is ethical and so forth. Now, did you see that distinction, category distinction between ethical questions and medical me meta-ethical questions? How many times have you heard me explain this point ad nauseum to various atheists and opponents who act like there's no such thing as a paradigm level critique? There's no such thing as paradigm level, meta level questions. Okay, so there's no such thing as meta logic. There's no such thing as meta ethics. That, that's how stupid the people are. Like go under the comments of the Matt Dillahunty debate on his channel. Go under the comments of the Matt Dillahunty debate on my channel. These people are completely stupid. No idea what they're talking about using very well-known terms in academia. And they say it's word salad. It's all made up. Now, they might perhaps try to argue the position that, well, there isn't actually anything meta-ethical and then smush the two into the same type of thing, right? 
oh, there's not actually meta-ethical problems because all problems are identical. They're all solved and known in the same way, a kind of grand narrative or unifying materialist type of approach. Again, if they want to make that move, let them do it because that is one of the stupidest moves they'll make. And they'll fall into the notion of crackers in the pantry fallacy. Oh, really? So everything is proven in the same way through five cents data? Or How do you prove love through five cents data? How do you prove abstract concepts, math through sense data? Is the way that you prove somebody's a murderer the same as the way that you prove a math problem? I mean, really, you want to be that dumb to say that everything is proven in the same evidentiary way? Of course it's not. This is so silly. And even in the debate, Matt Dillahunty admitted not everything is proven in the same way. Okay, oh, wait a minute. So not everything is proven in a reductionistic, empiricist way. Okay, so what's the proof for the transcendental categories that you said you believe in? There is no proof. They just are. And people literally think that Matt won that debate when that's what he said. I mean, people like Cameron at Cucking Christianity. I mean, these people are unbelievable. I don't think Cameron even understands the debate. So I don't. he's not even qualified to decide who, who won that debate when he doesn't even understand anything about the debate. Um, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. So you seem to say that there is a principle that we should avoid maximal suffering for conscious creatures. So do we agree that you are not deriving that principle from what is? That's an extra little bit of axiom. Yeah. I mean, so he's putting it in a very simple way that we should avoid maximal suffering. And where did you get this from matters of fact? Well, no, I, I'm, I would say that like every other scientific discipline, a science of value in this sense does have to pull itself up by its bootstraps. On. It's called epistemic bootstrapping. This is the problem that you hear us bring up all the time. And he's realizing the problem. Like, yeah, I'm going to have to find something to start with to kind of pull myself up. But epistemic bootstrapping projects don't work especially when we're talking about futile human autonomous systems system building systems like basic bitch naive empiricism right with some axioms so you know physics has axioms. i'm gonna have to epistemic bootstrap with some axiom this is called foundationalism how often do you hear me critiquing foundationalism and isn't it funny that Sam Harris and Stefan Molyneux and Trent Horn and T Dump and Azra Rashid all have the same position to start their natural theology project. And yes, every one of them can do a form of natural theology. Did you not realize that the Enlightenment philosophers did natural theology? They just dispensed with the God of the natural theology system. And here we have public intellectuals repeating the same stupid shit for the last 500 years. It's amazing. It's amazing. And you would think you would be able to show them, as we've shown in every one of those debates that I've list listed, all the people that we debated, the same issue has come up, the same issue that's coming up now, tonight, with him. And they resort to saying just give me my axiom self-evident starting point to build my foundational system <laughs> and all i have to do is do the same thing that he's doing again even though sean carroll isn't a presuppositionalist he's doing what i would do uh okay how are you going to justify the axiom the starting point this thing that you want me to grant you i'm going to grant you why am i going to grant you that what are you talking about <laughs> this is this is not uh car salesmanship this is not you know haggling on the at the parking lot over the mercedes this is philosophy you don't get the you don't get stuff granted this is debate I grant you stuff what are you talking about seems like the value of understanding the world in a logically coherent way or even in, even in a way that doesn't seem logically coherent but is incoherent by some other logic that we can't 
into it, right? So as is the case with quantum mechanics. So there's some brute fact of epistemology. There's some ah, and there we have it. The same thing he said to Jordan Peterson four years later. The same thing I constantly critique. Oh, really? A brute fact. Uh, as an empiricist, <laughs> can you please give an account for your brute fact and explain to me how the words mean and how the principles obtain over time and how this and that? They'll never do it. They can't. Yank of the bootstraps that has to get your epistemic bootstrapping, self-evident axioms. Give me my starting point, please. Let me pull myself up my my, my bootstraps. You can't. It'll never work. It's impossible. Because it's too much of a tall order, right? For an individual finite being whose conceptual scheme is completely a construct to give an account for universal claims, it's impossible. You'll never get there. It's another one of David Hume's points. From this inductive point to this inductive point to this inductive point, it doesn't matter how many finite sense data pieces of data you have, you will never be able to leap to the universal cause or claim or principle on empiricist grounds. It's a very simple point. So you might believe in all of these universal principles, but you can't justify them. But now, wait a minute. I thought we were going to be rationalist and reasonable evidence-based people who only believe what the evidence supports. But now we're believing in all these things to be evidentialist empiricists that we can't evidentially prove. Let's give the classic example. All knowledge comes through sense data, right? Empiricism 101, the most basic bitch presupposition of naive empiricism. Where in sense data do you prove that proposition itself? Where in sense data are you told that all knowledge comes through sense data? All, all knowledge, that is a universal claim. There's nothing that tells you that. So it's an arbitrary starting point that attempts to build an entire system and the arbitrary starting point is unjustified as an empiricist on empiricist's own grounds. There's no basis to make the move from empirical sense data as an individual finite mind to saying all knowledge comes through sense data. Do you see this? This is a very simple very clear, self-evident truth. <laughs> I'm being, I'm joking when I say that. But it should be self-evident in the sense that it should be, a, a, a truth is self-attesting, we could say, right? So that there should be a kind of inner intuitive sense that that's false, right? Just like we intuitively inner sense that two plus two is not five. Do you see this point? Atheists, this is a very simple argument. It refutes 99% of you. Do you hear this? Right? Before we started. And I actually can find nothing more fundamental from my point of view than the fact of consciousness, the fact that something seems to be happening. I mean, this is, this is compatible with us being confused about everything else, right? We, this could be a simulation, we're in the matrix, we're a brain in a vat, this is a dream, I'm the only one who exists. All of that's possible. I could be radically confused, mistaken about everything, and yet, the one thing I can't be confused about, the one thing that can't be an illusion is that something seems to be happening. And that so, I mean, it's like these people have never read beyond like a cursory analysis of philosophy. I mean, anybody with any sense can see and learn that Descartes' cogito or the variations of the cogito have been savagely demolished for centuries. Even Bertrand Russell demolished this. To say that my one brute fact that I'm going to start with is something seems to be happening to me. Assumes a host of things. I hope you guys see this, right? Something. What? <laughs> Does he, it's like he didn't even realize that he's assuming that sentences have meaning when he says this. To say this propositions assume that sentences and propositions are meaningful, dude. It assumes that words have meaning. It assumes that you as an individual exist. And have, remember, he's talked about all kinds of things that he hasn't justified. Yeah, he talks about consciousness. 
I mean, your whole discipline, right, has not and has basically surrendered the fact that we can't make sense of consciousness as a materialist. But he just assumes, right, that there's consciousness is occurring. What does that even mean, dude? Remember, the scientism positivist approach has to cut off any words that you can't kind of paste in a one-to-one correspondence to a physical object. That's how some of those positives, right? Remember how stupid that Carnap Ayer level stuff got, right? That we covered in uh, Two Dogmas. And yet here he is making all these metaphysical claims. Consciousness is occurring. What? And remember Quine's great criticism at the end of the paper? For you to say consciousness is occurring at time T is literally the equivalent of fairy tales in terms of justification. In terms of justification, empiricists making metaphysical claims and assertions, universal claims, has the exact same epistemological justificatory status as the Greek gods. That was the point at the end, one of the points at the end of Two Dogmas. So Sam just doesn't get it. What I'm calling consciousness. And then the only other axiom to add is that there is a difference between the worst possible state of consciousness and the best. So he's got two axioms that he thinks are self-evident. Things are just occurring to me, I think he said. And we should avoid the worst possible situations. Number one, first of all, you can't justify or give an account for all the things that were assumed in the first proposition, as we just saw, right? The critiques of the cogito. And the second proposition or axiom, excuse me, does not follow from this one. So, and there's no necessary connection or relation between these two. Consciousness is occurring Therefore, I ought to avoid the worst situations. What? It doesn't follow. And the fact that he's not... We're asking for how you know that there's good and bad. Better, worst. What is the criterion, the delineation problem? This is uh, oftentimes brought up uh, in these kinds of epistemology issues where people make these kinds of statements... And then the philosopher says, well, but that assumes that you have a prior criteria by which to sort out different types of truths or propositions or different types of knowledge or different types of claims or different types of values. So what is the basis for the delineation criteria, which is prior to you actually delineating? Well, these are the self-evident truths and these are the non-self-evident truths, right? It's a problem you can ask to a foundationalist. Oh, really? So you have a prior criteria by which you can sort out the self-evident truths from the non-self-evident truths. Okay, but if that's a prior criteria, then it's not, then it's prior to the ones that were self-evident, you see. So it begs, then the the ones that are self-evident actually aren't self-evident. They actually require and are based on another more fundamental proposition about the delineation criteria. Insofar as those can be discovered. If anything matters, that difference matters. That's where ethics come in. And and that's begging the question. We ask for a justification and he says, what matters is what matters. <laughs> we can see where T Dump gets his uh, you know, ideological right underpinnings of this kind of stuff. So the reason why the meta ethics the only relevant meta ethics here and the, the meta ethics is you know, the, the meta-ethical doubt you could introduce here is, and, and people do this, but I can't believe they mean what they think they mean. They'll say things like, well, who's to say that the worst possible misery for everyone is bad? Right? Like, so where can you... I mean, does he not realize that there are sadomasochists? There are tyrannical rulers throughout history. There are Satanists. There are uh, sexual creeps. And we're, I mean, does he actually think that, like, this doesn't exist? I mean, history is full of people who really get out a pleasure out of torturing people. And many of those people rise to very powerful positions, right? Roman emperors that like to torture people. Pagan cult leaders that like to do human sacrifice. Stand. 
so as to form that doubt. Like, you know, again, I'll just take you to a hot stove and let's have this conversation, right? Like, there's something more fundamental than the, the intuition you think you have that can motivate that doubt, right? So, of course, science requires assumptions to get off the ground the basic intelligibility of the world, some rough correspondence of our sensory data with things that happen. And th Did you hear the couple things he's listing? What does that sound like? Presuppositions, assumptions, the things that I talk about all the time. He's listing a few of those. You see, I'm not making this stuff up. It's not word salad. He's saying things you hear me say because this is part of the academic discourse. So, so forth. Uh, Morality or ethics also require assumptions to get off the ground. The point is that the assumptions you need to get morality off the ground are not a subset of the ones you need to get science off the ground. You're introducing a new assumption that we should avoid the maximum pain for conscious creatures. So how is that an assumption that is any less fundamental? I didn't say than, it was. Okay. But, it's just not science. But it's not science to say we should understand so remember, Harris said that science can give us values. And Carol is simply saying, science has nowhere under its subset this additional proposition that you said that we should avoid maximal suffering. There's nothing in scientific data that tells you that. Sam Harris said, but you touch an oven and your hand goes back. That's not a justification for a not. That's a is so all he's done is give another is, another state of affairs that this occurs and is acting like that's a justification for why it ought not occur. That's not a justification. You can't appe keep appealing to things that are the case. It just is. Well, it just is. Yeah, but that doesn't tell us whether it ought not to be or ought to be. World either. That's an ought that you smuggle in in order to motivate science. It's, it's, but it's, it's, it's not medicine to say that you should cure disease. It's just once you agree that you should cure disease, you can have a science of medicine. Right. But the things we learn by doing science, let's put it this way. Uh, think about possible worlds, right? The philosopher David Lewis liked to talk in these terms. Imagine all the different ways the world could be. One way to think about what science does is to say there's all these different ways the world could be. Let's go look at it and figure which one it is. So the world, the universe could be expanding. It could be contracting. We don't know. We need to go look at it. That's how we learn what is, by making these observations. Your principle that we should avoid the maximum uh, suffering for conscious creatures is not to learn that way. Well, so I can, again, I think we're getting hung up on the charge nature of this word should. Let's just say there is no should. But and yet there are all of these experiences on offer. And you from the core of your being as a conscious being will prefer some states over others. That is a fact. That is, that's that is a, that is a fact. fact about you. Yes. That is he keeps confusing a state of affairs, the tendency of beings to uh, flee with that. It ought to be the case as a universal value. And he just can't guess. He just can't grasp this, right? They're two different things. Even in his own philosophy and materialistic atheistic worldview, they're two different things, and so he needs to be consistent. Part of the is, yeah, you know, yeah, and science can understand that ultimately. Yes, right. And what we have, therefore, is this navigation problem. You care whether you burn in fire for eternity. I do, and and that's it's in the nature. And if there is a state where that happens, science subsumes that fact. Right. Right. And if there's a way to avoid that science, some completed science subsumes that. Fact. Yes. And so, so in my view, these claims about what's possible for conscious minds captures every everything we could conceivably care about. But you for some reason, which I'm a little confused about. Should, Here he goes. This is going to be where he really nails him on this point to, to this picture. You the the navigation problem still exists. <laughs> no, no. I that, don't. I'm yeah. just, it is a should claim. It, you know, you, there are things that will happen in the world. There are different ways that things could happen, and they would be associated with different levels of suffering. And that's it. And we stop.
right? If all we're doing is science, we're describing what happens in the world or what could happen, and we stop. But to do anything about morality, morality is necessarily a set of statements about what we ought to do, what should happen, what is right and wrong. Well, no, and because, all it, we it, need it, it to could, do is just... admit one more axiom that we should... I like this uh, line of argument. So it's like he's saying what moral claims are, statements about ethics, what we should and shouldn't do. And it's like Sam Harris is saying, well, why don't we just redefine ethics to be facts? <laughs> and then we won't have this problem anymore, right? So how do I avoid uh, Hume's problems about uh, ought from is? Well, I'll just say all the oughts are is. I mean, literally, that's the level of this. This is just mind-boggling, really. Avoid the greatest suffering, and we can't derive it from what is, and then we can stop talking about meta-ethics and talk about ethics. First of all, you, you're not, I don't think you're acknowledging all of the mad work done by people who think that you can't actually make universal claims, realistic claims about right and wrong, good and evil. So it's like they, they, well, I they, didn't they agree they, with your axiom. Yeah. Want- so did you catch that? You can't make universal claims about ethics and, and morals. No one can make universal. Uh, Sam, that's a universal claim. See, that is pre-sub right there. Listening to the person that you're debating, listening to their argument, Taking the phrases, the propositions, and the sentences, just take that sentence. No one can make universal claims. No one can justify or make universal ethical moral claims. That's a universal moral ethical claim. You admit that it's an axiom. Well, my claim is that you can get there with just is claims about the situation we're in. We all will have this preference not to burn in fire for eternity, right? So that, what? That, that's, that's of the nature of uh, what it is to be a conscious being and the difference between burning in fire and not, right? And there are right answers with respect to how to avoid that. So this is a, just a description of the situation. Do where I want to avoid it? Yeah. Should I? No, no, but you want to avoid it and there's a way to avoid it. That, doesn't that- should- so again, it's a very simple question. The fact that I want to avoid something is not the same thing as that I should avoid something. Two different questions. I avoid it? Should you avoid it? Should I make other people avoid it? But the, the should is derivable from the feeling of how bad. So oughts are derivable from bad feelings. This is just so inane, right? No, it's not. That's the point. It's an unjustified move. I know you want to derive the ought from the pain but it's not a justified move it's a non sequitur it doesn't follow it is to be in fire for eternity if we assume that we should avoid the feeling of being in fire for all eternity but but what i'm saying is that the the claim the question the place that it It seems like very liberating for you to just say yes we should assume that (laughs) well but yeah i mean he's just pointing out that your argument is assuming that we ought not be in pain right and if Harris would just admit that, that would be a more truthful position to admit that that's what's assumed. <laughs> but that's what's in question. I'm, I'm, I just don't see, there, there's no alternative. Well, like, if you actually... If there's no alternative, then we should certainly do it. But I, it's, not, it's, not even, it's not even an operation. That, that's what I'm saying. If there's no alternative, the gesture is, it, it can't even be made. So if, if you're actually tracking what is meant by the words, the worst possible misery for everyone... There's no place to stand where you could say, well, should we really avoid that? Maybe there, maybe we have other priorities. Maybe there's something more important than avoiding the worst possible misery for everyone. You really don't want to just admit, I mean, I, no, I, I could I, certainly yeah. imagine all sorts of alternative what, what, axioms. Imagine another priority. We should maximize the suffering of conscious creatures. But, but, but who are we? Who are we in that case? Yeah, it's like he's missing the point, right? On what basis should I choose, on the one hand, that we should maximize all the suffering versus that we should minimize all the suffering? What is the prior criterion, the delineation problem that's a prior question that tells you one of these is the one you're supposed to choose? On what basis? And here, Harris, just kept saying, he, Harris just keeps saying, because it hurts people, because it's bad. Yeah, begging the question, exactly. We are among the conscious creatures. Yeah, we should, yeah. Uh, 
I, again, I'm not that there's an ethical question about whether or not this is the right axiom to choose. But there is a perfectly transparent, logical question about do we need such an axiom? Well, no, I, I think it's it's interesting. This is one of these conversations where there you go, boom, eviscerated, stated in perfectly precise, clear, logical precision that there's really nowhere for Harris to go because he's just been pinned down some level all you can appeal to are your intuitions about the kind of the meanings of words like again how does he know as an empiricist that all you can appeal to is intuitions i mean he just throws out these claims these these sort of grand universal states of affairs and propositions which are totally unjustified so we're granting all that right we should be calling out every single sentence this guy says but um, to keep it on the same point of just the moral realism and the is ought question, notice how far down the rabbit hole he's taken us in winding through the labyrinth here, and he's pinned down, and there's just nowhere else to go. Because it's stated really clear that these types of claims are one type of claim. These types of claims are another type of claim, and you want to subsume these under these, and it just doesn't work. You can't just redefine all of the oughts as is is to avoid the question should, should or but i think or, no, I, or what I, it means to embrace an axiom i disagree i think that uh and again the, the the example i do in the book came from john searle who i picked on a lot um uh but he did the same kind of thing you're doing the same kind of thing i would argue david hume was arguing against he said he wrote a paper entitled how to derive ought from is and he started with something like, I say a certain sentence, a clear is statement. And then he just sort of translated that sentence very gradually. And at the end, he said, yeah, I ought to act this way. Know, I, I agree that Searle's maneuver there smuggled in, the, but he was playing by Hume's rules, right? I, I, don't, I think there's something more fundamental than the rules Hume set up. That's what if I'm trying to get For whatever at. reason, you are reluctant to admit that you are uh, assuming that we should not maximize the suffering of conscious creatures, then all you can do is say, here are some things that could happen, and here is the suffering that would be attached to them. But to say that is to pretend to stand somewhere outside that system where there's nothing else that ma could conceivably matter more than the thing you're describing right talk about word salad right i mean uh, how often do the atheists the materialists accuse us me of word salad i mean wh where is he going with this talk about just rambling and filibustering <laughs> word selling i mean he's like has, i don't think he's actually offered an argument he's offered to redefine oughts as is but that's not an argument that's a an attempt to uh escape the problem that's an ad hoc rescue. The mattering comes in. The mattering is not a, a layer you, you apply to it after the fact. You certainly don't want to take the epistemological stance that what should and should not happen is really just achievable by definition. I think there is substance to choosing between different standpoints from which to get morality. And I think that this is, this is the, the reason why this conversation is sort of, I mean, it's an important conversation to have. I'm all in favor of having it. But it's frustrating because it's 5% of the conversation we should have. Because if we could admit that one makes an assumption to get morality off the ground, just like one makes science assumption. There we go. And what are we trying to constantly point out about presuppositional critique? looking at the assumptions what is assumed in that guy's argument what is assumed in that guy's sentence what is assumed in that guy's presentation in that paragraph in one sentence one claim all knowledge comes through sense data no one can derive or make universal claims from sense data there are no universal ethical norms but that's a universal almost ethical norm right i've always admitted that in the sense that 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 is the every scientific enterprise every foundational enterprise does have this 
root fact, pull yourself by the bootstraps maneuver. And science there he goes, talking about science as a foundationalist enterprise, and it must have these brute facts. They're not justifiable. Why should we believe in your arbitrary brute fact? And why, on what basis is it brute? On what basis is it self-evident? On what basis is it self-referencing? On what basis is that one self-evident versus all the ones that aren't self-evident? And how do you justify the delineation criteria, which is prior to that question, to put them into the two different categories or camps? No no idea what how he would answer any of those, right? He would have no, would be lost. He's already lost on this basic question. And, so, and the, the thing I've always been railing against is this apparent double standard where people ask of a universal morality something they would never ask of physics physics isn't self-justifying no they don't they re they're really not well, they yeah exactly uh i mean i'm glad Ca carol called him on this point they're just well, they pointing do, out because i've been on the other side of the, those conversations the, they're pointing out that this extra thing you need is not subsumed within the things you already have yeah and he can't get that this extra axiom to get morality off the ground is not one of the axioms well, we need to get science off the ground when yeah so if it's is claims are different from ought claims and harris has just tried to make ought claims is claims and he's saying it doesn't work you can't do that so it's incoherent it's a contradiction i want to remind you guys go on over to uh my r-o-k-f-i-n if you haven't subscribed to me over there please do uh your your you're not getting if you're subscribed on the website it's the same content sometimes it takes me a while to um transfer it over to both but uh nobody's getting cheated it's the same content there is my channel there where you can come follow me it's a great free speech based platform and everybody's saying when are you going to cover uh russia ukraine the situation i did a two-hour stream yesterday on that got deep into the mirsheim lectures got deep into the history of um the orthodox issues there the schism we covered some of Jim Jotras and other people's uh, approaches. So you can go check that out. Those, those uh, I think, would be up your alley. If you're looking for my commentary on this, obviously this platform, you can't really talk about those kinds of issues there. So uh, that kind of content is over at Rockfin. Also, want to remind you guys, we have a smooth sponsor. What? A new sponsor. We have all of our great classic sponsors, but I want to tell you about Exter. Check this out. This is a smooth baby. Look at that James Bond style wallet, baby. Check this out. You open this up. What do you got in there? Minimalism, baby. We're talking about smooth James Bond wallet minimalism. This is totally leather. They've got like all kinds of fancy wallets. Do you want to be sitting on a gigantic boomer sized fat ass thing that makes you tip over? You got your wallet full of your, your Kroger card. Your uh, Walgreens card, your copays, all that nonsense. No, no, no. You want a smooth, slim, minimalist Exter, E K S T E R wallet. Check this out. It's got a dang button that you push this button. Watch this. Watch this. Booyah. There's my cards. Now you say, why is this a big deal? Who cares about a button inside of a wallet that hides your cards? This is a smart wallet, bro. This is a wallet that protects your RFID chip. All of them hackers, right? All of those <coughs> Russian hackers running around. <coughs> CIA. <coughs> uh, Russian hackers. Yeah, right. Right. CIA Vault 7 hackers running around trying to hack up inside of your stuff. All of those zero cools running around. Angelina Jolie over there with dyed pink hair hacking into your wallet trying to get your stuff no -uh, not anymore jolie you're not getting in my wallet angelina trying to steal my bitcoin get out of there get out get, get up. this wallet will literally tell angelina jolie to get out of your wallet she is not going to ha hack your rfid cards because these extra wallets are smooth baby and i'm liking it now they also come with GPS, if you want to do this, they give you an option of getting an app and you can GPS follow where your wallet is. If you want to store this little bad boy right up in there, check that out. Smooth, small, slim. You can put it in your breast pocket, right? Somebody's going to come up, try to fill you up, try to steal your wallet out of your back. 
They're looking for that big fat boomer wallet. Hand size. No, you don't. No, no. Quit grabbing my butt because my wallet is not there. It is right here in my pocket. And it's slim and it's minimal. And I'm telling you right now, if you go over to extra.com, you will get that discount. They're giving me that J Dyer discount. See that right there? See the extra wallet in the show description. There's a big fat long link. It won't fit in the comments. Get over there in that show description. Click on over there. Get you one of these smooth James Bond wallets, baby. I mean, that's what I thought. It's like this is like a James Bond wallet, right? And yes, you can put your dollar bills in there too. But if you want to protect your card, you don't want to get hacked. You don't want that RFID chip hacked. Get yourself an extra wallet. They got all kinds. They got leather. They got metal. They got everything. Right, Fancy man wallets, baby. Get on over to extra.com right now. And remember, we're fighting against soytheism. We don't want to be soytheists. We don't want to be supporting big soy, big farms. You know what I mean? And the way that we do that is that we fight back through a good diet, which you hear me promoting all the time, which you hear Tristan promoting all the time. Shout out to beautiful Tristana. And you also do it by bumping up that testosterone. You guys know I love the Tonkat Ali. Get over to chalk.com right now. This is a show sponsor. I'm trying something new, right? I'm going to move over to, I'm going to take a break from the Tonkat because you guys can tell I'm always hyped up. I'm always pumped up. I'm going to try taking the daily, which I love, which I paused that for a little bit. I'm going to pause my Tonkat. I'm going to take my daily. And I'm going to take action and she legit. And we're going to see how that affects me. Because I've, I've not taken a lot of action 2.0. I've taken a little bit. This is a great product right here. I enjoyed it when I first took it. When I first got my chalk.com. But I like to experiment. And I like to vary it a little bit. You don't want to take too many at once. I mean, I took three Tonkats one day and I could not sleep. Do not take three Tonkat Elise in one day. Please, I promise you, don't do that. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to take a pause break from the Tonkat Elite. I'm going to try the Daily, the Action 2.0, and the She Legit because I'm going to see if it focuses my mental clarity. I got a lot of, right? I got a lot of rage. Testosterone. I want to I want to calm that a little bit. Not because I want to go to sleep, because I want to think a little bit clearer. And I'll see if... Those three products actually help me do that. But hey, they've got everything over there for guys and for girls. They're a awesome show sponsor, chalk.com. Use the promo code in the show description, J50J50. They are a beloved red pill company. We love those guys. They're awesome. One of our longest, biggest, fattest sponsors in that PHAT way, not in the FAT way. Ain't nobody over there FAT. Everybody or their PHAT, right? So be sure and make use of those 50% discounts because we don't know how long that will be there. Uh, again, ironically, we had more people in the last month buying the 50% discount than they did the 60% discount the month before. Guys, don't wait until it's a 40% discount in the upcoming month. Get the 50% discount right now. Support our show, support shock.com. And support your own health, right? Fight big soy and all this nonsense by you getting healthy, by you upping your toxic masculinity. We're actually pro-toxic masculinity. We're masculinity up in here. Get on over to chalk.com. And let's look at these super chats. Now, I was going to do open forum, but uh, for some reason, Twitter space crapped out on me. So I don't know why I, I didn't press the right buttons. I don't know. Funky D, Frankie D, $10. Jay, it's been demoralizing watching my fellow MAGA types protest the trampling of the rights of through COOF, but then switch to believing what they see in media. Well, that's what happens with wartime, right? We all know that wars are great for the regime to distract everybody and get them to buy into the ineffectual, incompetent leaders 
and then get everybody to 100% just believe whatever the media who has openly lied for decades. Now, suddenly we're going to trust them uh, when it comes to the wartime scenarios. What can you do? Don't worry about it, Frankie D. Just move on. Live your life. Frankie D says again, it is crazy how many people forget everything that they went through for the last six years. Well, yeah. Welcome to my world. (laughs) Now we want to fight for a regime, a.k.a. Biden, who was trying to force us to get COVID stabs. Why would anyone want to preserve the Biden R-E-G-I-M-E? Well, uh, yeah, you would think that given how often the media... I mean, let's go all the way back to Bush, nine, the big nine. I mean, the lies were going on then, y'all. <laughs> we're, hello? It's not just, they didn't just start lying six years ago, five years ago. And they were lying before before George and the mustard gashes. You were there with us, you were there with the They were lying before that. Uh, a certain individual sent 20 bucks, but bro, sorry, man. Not going to read it. Um, I appreciate you reaching out, but if you would like to send me money, I'm not asking for your money, but if you, if you want to argue with me over what the word debate means, I don't really want to interact with you. So I'm not interested. You don't have to send me money, man. If you want to apologize for being ridiculous, you can do that. Gay human pumpkin, $3. Sam Harris gets his, um, can't read that one, bro. <laughs> but uh, interesting. Frankie D, $3. I was too bathed from all of my chalk that they hit me with sanctions. <laughs> I can only spend three plebe dollars. Well, you already spent 20 So sorry that we had to enact uh, sanctions against you, but you're probably a bigot. Morals are obvious, $3. Harris's main argument is an appeal to incredulity. Well, that's a fallacy. He only needs one premise for all the normies to agree that the worst possible misery for everyone is bad. Yeah, but that's a arbitrary. It's not a justified statement. If you accept that, which most people do, his moral landscape follows. Everything away from that becomes good. Yeah, but it's unjustified. Uh, remember that they are foundationalists. They are empiricists. And if you're an empiricist, we need empirical sense data to believe his presuppositions and that is not the one premise so this is another foolish kind of basic philosophical mistake the fact that he lists a first premise as a starting point does not necessarily mean that that's only the first starting point because for example he's assuming that sentences have meaning that language works that it matches up to things in the world but he hasn't even begun to question that yet. So there's not actually a self-evident brute fact axiom. This, this has just been so savagely critiqued for centuries in philosophy. It's amazing that people still do this stuff. Coom Pod 2100 early adopter $2. Mr. Dyer, we would like to inform you that the Coom Pod will be shipped tomorrow and will be arriving within one month. A signature will be required upon delivery. Thank you for your patronage. Thank you, uh, Coom Pod bot over there at... Amazon.com. Morals be simple, dog. $3. Meta ethics can't get off the ground with normal people because once you say the worst possible misery for everyone might not be bad, you've lost them. Yeah, but that's why you have to stress the point of what justification is in philosophy. People don't care about grounding their moral beliefs. They're relativistic. Yeah, exactly. But if they want to adopt those things, then you just simply point out to them that they can't argue. There's no such thing as argumentation. And their own position is self-refuting. And if you can show people that their position is self-refuting, then you've done your job as an apologist. That's the point here. No, you're not going to convert everybody. That's true. A lot of people are going to think that they can willfully choose relativism and subjectivism. But what can you do? Um, Ultimately, you just just pray for them. Jonathan Michael Akin, $5. What is the orthodox view of middle divine knowledge if we hold such a view how do we interpret such example examples of counter counter facts in scripture if they had been known they would have wouldn't have crucified him 
Well, I mean, we would say that there are real contingencies and God knows what will be chosen, but I don't think it's a problem for divine omniscience to say that there are contingencies because there are real contingencies, even though God knows the choices that we're going to make. But the example that you gave, if they had known they would not have crucified him, um, I just don't see why that's a problem. As if God doesn't know. I, I just don't get it. Harry Burgos, $10. Great show. I love the Globus Book Series. It is a class of its own. Thank you. Uh, be sure and share those Global uh, Book Series with your buddies. Jerry Jerry Mills, $10. How would you use tag with somebody who believes in a generic creator? Um, Bonson and Lyle seem to focus on an atheist. Um, I would go a different route uh, because... To say that there's just a generic creator doesn't really tell us anything. Like, how? what's the basis that they have for that belief? What's the basis that they have for knowing facts or things about that creator? Right? So they're, go they're going to need revelation, right? It's not enough to just say, oh, well, there's just this generic creator. Out there. Well, so does that mean deism? Does that mean pantheism? Does that mean animism? You see? I mean, any of those positions could be, quote, creator-based positions, and yet, I mean, many pagan religions could affirm some kind of origin or something like that. Certainly probably not creation ex nihilo. But that's where you get into the more uh, precise arguments about Trinitarian metaphysics and orthodox uh, paradigm or orthodox metaphysics, right? Which sets us off against Unitarian positions, pantheistic positions, monistic positions, or dualistic positions. Um, and there, I do have other talks where we've talked about those. Determined a dude one dollar. If even if everyone is determined, you can still persuade people because they may be determined or persuaded by the reasons, and you don't know until you try. Yeah, but that's not the point. The point is that there's no reason or explanation for one choice of the good as opposed to the bad. There's no good or bad if everything's determined. You see, there's no, there's nothing, there's no principle by which. One thing is preferable to another if everything is determined because there are no agents able to make choices, you see. There is no agency. So I don't know why you, you can't grasp the difference between ought and is. The fact that you are doing something doesn't mean that you should be doing something in that view. Harris fan, $2. Harris is not saying one objective morality he says many possible right an answers, similar to relativism, but objective wrong ones. Okay, I don't know what that means. Uh, these are these are mutually exclusive positions. He says you can't object to health like this, but you don't. What is health? Who says a healthy person isn't dead? I don't. This is gibberish. No idea what you're saying. It's a simple question of uh, uh, a justification of claims, but I don't think you understand what justification is. Jay Poopy, $15. Jay, you mentioned in a previous video that all competing worldviews of non-Orthodox can be easily reduced to a handful of repu refutable starting points. Monism, dualism, yeah, exactly. Most of them. Uh, would you mind listing the most prominent ones? Those are the most prominent ones. Most people's worldviews are a form of monism, a, fo a form of dualism, or one of these other kind of dead-end positions like solipsism. So you yourself listed them. I mean... Most of the world religions affirm a form of monism or dualism. Buddhism, Shintoism, Hinduism. Okay. They're either monistic or dualistic. Pe people like Harris and these kinds of people, they end up in solipsism. Most, many of the Enlightenment philosophers' positions, Kant, Hume, they end in solipsism if you follow through with them. Descartes. Those Enlightenment philosophical positions are solipsistic. Because if you follow the history of Western philosophy, especially with Hume and Kant, you can no longer justify belief in an external world. Okay, well, if there's no external world, there's a divide between the phenomena and the noumena, then I'm just stuck in my own mind. Reality is just a projection of my mind. At least that's the best I could do. I might not like that. I might think there's an objective, commonly experienced world out there. But I can't prove that. I can't know that. That's the dead end of those positions. God, morality, 
okay, is God's, all right, now I'm, I'm not going to read that because we've done the youth of fraud dilemma countless times. I've answered it probably 50 times in the last three years in discord. Um, I'm just not going to do it. Josiah 718, spiritually speaking, this is idolatry. The arrogance of the intellect glorifies the mighty man rather than recognizing the glory of God. Worship is given to the type and not the prototype. The essence of idolatry is to glorify the mind of man. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, and that's really the, the, the sin of the enlightenment, right, is the exaltation of reason to this extreme degree, the intellect. And ironically, as Father Seraphim Rose points out in Nihilism, Roots of the Revolution, the enlightenment revolution to glorify and deify man's reasoning and intellect ultimately leads to the postmodern nihilist revolution, which seeks to then destroy man. Exactly. That's the logic of revolution. Pray for today's audio. One dollar. Get headphones. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that. J Poopy, ten dollars. I'm currently trying to argue, outline arguments that help refute Protestants, Muslims, atheists, and generally retain your arguments in gre greater detail. Do you put, no, I don't do outlines, bro. Come on. Do I do outlines? Do I seem like a systematic kind of person? Sorry, I don't have outlines for you. I don't list charts of arguments. I just talk. This is not my style. Um, go read Father Deacon's papers, though. He has some papers in the Discord. And he puts things into... Uh, more of a coherent, you know, whatever. But thank you for that super chat, JPP. UPB, $2. All conscious humans prefer to f not to feel pain. Masochists invert that spectrum. It's pleasure. We all prefer pleasure. Just like logical inference of bootstrapping oughts. Okay, I don't... Universal pre universally preferred beliefs, I guess is what you mean by UPB. Uh, your name, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. You, you, you don't understand the, the point is about justifying the leap from preferences to universals. It doesn't exist. That's what Harris said, that there's no universal claims. The fact that conscious beings do X does not mean or translate into conscious beings ought to do X. I know you think that. I know you would like to say that there's an ought. You want to have oughts. The point is that you can't justify the ought. I'm so tired of these dumb arguments over and over and over. Can you got can you not understand what the argument is? It doesn't matter what the beings prefer or don't prefer because that's under the domain of what is. You can never get to what they ought or ought not to do without begging the question. Guys, it's not that hard. Logic, bro, $2. Deductive logic has issues. I, d did you think that my arguments are somehow just based on deductive logic? Okay, induction and deduction go together. I'm not making an argument on the basis of deductive deduction. So I don't know what you're talking about. You make a million premises that describe a squirrel. It's gray. It is tall, blah, blah, blah. You can never then in conclude that a squirrel is logical. Thus, it's just like when you try to prove God. Okay, again, the transcendental argument is not an argument from deduction. I don't know where you got that. So you're totally confused. The transcendental argument is about preconditions, and that would relate to the principle of induction as a precondition or the principle of deduction. I'm not making a deductive argument. Again, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Rachel Wilson, $3. Please don't chill on the morons. I know everyone is always telling you not to be mad. I don't know why. But I'm not. This is how I do live streams, right? I'm not mad. If I go off of here and I, I'm having fun, this is what I do. This is what's entertaining. So if you find me too aggressive, then don't watch my streams. I know you're not saying that, Rachel. I'm talking about other people. Don't, don't get mad. Don't get mad. These propped up atheists and dum-dums need to be taken down. And you are good at doing it. Thank you so much for that, Rachel. Appreciate that. Patrick, $3. Here, take my money. Okay, I will do that. Thank you so much, Patrick. If you would hit like and share, I uh, hope you everybody had a good night. And uh, sorry to the slow boys that gave me $3 super chats that don't understand the arguments. My bad. My bad that I didn't elucidate for the thousandth time for you, right? I know that after 999 times of me making these arguments that I should give you the thousandth time to make this point. 
But if you didn't get it the first 999 times, you're probably not going to get it the thousandth time. Orthodox Chad, $5. I just finally made the decision to become a catechism or start catechism. Oh, good. Awesome. That's great. So glad to hear that Orthodox Chad and uh, many years to you. And I hope that you do continue your catechesis and become Orthodox. All right, everybody have a good night. I will uh, talk to you soon. Jamie and I will be doing